right, well, welcome <laughs> everyone to Family Matters. Uh, as you know, usually, you know, Reeves teaches this class, but he has kindly asked me to come and teach this morning. So before we begin, though, walking through the materials for this week, I'd like to begin by briefly introducing myself, I guess kind of again, you know, since uh, Reeves was able to tell you a little bit about it just now. But um, so since my family are new here, I think that would be a, a fitting introduction for you all. My name is Andrew Record, and I am one of the lay pastors here at Buck Run. After I served two years in northern Kentucky as pastor, prayerfully we moved on from that church, and Dr. York very kindly welcomed us here uh, to Buck Run. And so let me just say that we are immensely blessed to be able to be here at Buck Run. And maybe you could say the same thing. I'm sure you could. Uh, so uh, we, I would count it a privilege, though, that I'm able to teach you this morning also. I'm blessed with my wife, Megan, and our three children. And we have one on the way as well. And he will be here in December. So we're looking forward to that very much so. So I hope that helps you kind of get to know me a little bit, uh, since I know not all of you here know me and uh, everything. But so um, we now turn to this week's focus on being made for God's family. But before we do, uh, let me open us up uh, with a word of prayer as well. Let's pray once more. Our great God, we come before you recognizing you are infinitely wise, infinitely good, and perfect in all you do, in all your plans, in all your purposes. We recognize that. We uh, come before you seeing that, come before you in submission to you and to your word. And we pray as we come that we would even rejoice in your Son, in whom we hope, who has great, who, you, Father, who have graciously sent your Son into the world to save us, to save sinners. And we glory in this salvation. We come asking you now that you would lead our time this morning. Help us to seek your face as families. Help us come with submissive hearts to your word. And help me to be faithful in teaching your word for your glory above all. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me begin by saying I've kept some of what you have there in your books, if you have your books with you there, and I've added some, and I've changed some there. So I think Reeves, he, he gave you a sheet there that you can follow along with also. That way you can see kind of where I'm heading along the way. So now as we come to this topic, recognizing our families we come to this topic recognizing our we come to uh, this topic recognizing our families are facing some very real and very serious challenges in our day from moral to technological to personal it can be hard to navigate through all of the issues our families are facing and i think that's very clear as even we watch the news unfold before our eyes as we see all these things There are some challenges for our families, and there's no doubt about that. And this, without even taking into account the regular, normal challenges every family must face, you know, personally and interpersonally. And so those are just some things that, you know, we we see. So some of these, though, these challenges, I'm going to skip because I didn't quite hit the button there. Some of the challenges we've already discussed. Reese has talked about them. So I'm go, I won't go real deep on each one of these because you've already seen and kind of discussed them. But one central challenge is the challenge of sin. So every square inch of our lives has been very obviously affected by sin. And we see the challenges of sin at every single level of all that we do, individually, and as families, and really in all of life. Another challenge our families face is that of gender and gender roles. Now from Scripture, we recognize the God-ordained fact of only two genders, male and female. 
And from Scripture, we recognize that there are God-given gender roles, but this is not what we hear from the world, right? <laughs> I mean, we recognize that from God, God's Word. We, we have reasons talked about that in these weeks before. And so we, but at the same time, that is definitely not what we're hearing around us. Our families, though, in light of all this, they aren't just facing the challenge of questioning gender roles. They're face, we're facing the challenge of, is there any such thing as gender at all? And that is, and that can have a huge effect on our families. Another challenge our families are facing is confusion over sex. So sex has become big business. All the while, it waylays our families, our churches, and our society. You know, scandal is common, even to the point where we're seeing well-known c- celebrities like Bill Cosby falter. I grew up not necessarily watching Bill Cosby, but every so often I would see him on the television, his show on, the tel- on television. And later on, you know, my wife, we, would, we actually bought his shows. And so we watched him, and then hearing all these things was shocking, as I'm sure it was for you. The Me Too movement has flooded the entertainment industry and politics, and really there seems like there's more to come. Another challenge is that of marriage and its meaning. Of course, all of these challenges in some way or another have affected marriage and have thrown its meaning in utter disarray in our culture. Now, like I said before, we've already addressed each of these challenges in one way or another, but importantly, all of these then turn to affect parents, how we parent, how we relate to our children, and how we even would see our children. And so there's more I can mention, like technology. I think you can think of the areas that we can face as families with technology that would be challenges there. But it's clear we must help our children through this vast web of moral and societal confusion. But the question is, how do we navigate all of these issues as parents? And the answer, we are given God's word. We are given God's word. So there, we are given real answers to these challenges. And we're given the foundations for ministering to our families. We are given clarity in the midst of confusion. There, in God's word, we recognize we and our children are sinners in need of the gospel. We can help our children then see the truth that God's purposes and his plans are good, including creating us as either male and female. That that is good, it's wise, and it is God's perfect plan, even as our culture says otherwise. So from God's word, we are given the call to lead and to disciple our children. Children need parents who model what a Christian looks like and how we both struggle and work through the issues of life as followers of Christ. So through parents, our children, they can see what loving God and what loving others looks like and what a gospel-defined marriage looks like. All these, not as those who have everything figured out. I mean, not, not at all. I'm sure you, know, you understand that. But as people who walk by faith and seek understanding for the sake of God's glory. So this morning then, to help us aim our families in this direction, we'll be looking at three areas, or three key areas here. One, God's word concerning children. Two, God's word concerning the role of parents and children in our families. And three, how we can aim our, our homes to be headquarters for gospel ministry. So that's kind of the practical answer to how we should do all these things. So first, God's word concerning children, be fruitful and multiply. And so the first point there, a main fruit of marriage is the bearing of children. Now with all sensitivity, I know for various reasons some aren't able to have children, but the normal, natural fruit and blessing of marriage is to have children. And this leads us to acknowledge the biblical truth 
that children aren't just a reward, they are a command. Children aren't just a reward, they are a command. So right at the beginning of our Bibles, in the book of Genesis, we see this command. So in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, it says this, And God blessed them, so Adam and Eve, man and woman, And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now this instantly confronts the idea that children are optional within marriage. We not only see this command here, those who are married are to have children, But we see the point that children are a main fruit and natural outflow of marriage as well. So marriage's purpose isn't primarily about having children, but part of marriage is having children. As, you know, Reeves talked about, I think it was last week, about the purpose of, maybe it wasn't last week, but he talked about how marriage is to image and to magnify the gospel and magnify Christ. So to show us just how important this command is, we see this command again later in Genesis. So after the fall, mankind's wickedness, it was great. You'll remember this. So such that God, he righteously flooded the earth, wiping out all of humanity outside of Noah and his family. So after these events, And after God made a covenant with Noah there to the only living family at that time, this command from Genesis 1 is given again, and it's reiterated. So Genesis 9, 1 says this, And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. So, let me say two things about that passage there. First, we see in the fact that God has repeated this command again, be fruitful and multiply, that God is serious about this command. Second, we see this command was given pre-fall, so pre-sin, and post-fall after sin. Now, I'm not sure if you've ever heard someone say this, but I've been told on multiple occasions, especially since we have three going on four children, and my wife Megan might laugh at this because she's heard this as well, you know, I don't know how a person could bring children into a world like this. Have you ever heard that before? (laughs) I know I have. Now, it's true. Our world is bad, but if we accept This kind of thinking, this kind of logic, the truth is we would never have children at all, whether one or ten. (laughs) Until Christ returns, we will be living, living in a fallen, broken world. And so since the fall, children have always been born into a world filled with toils, troubles, and snares. And to make it all the more evident that even post fall, we are to be fruitful and multiply. God has given us this command again in Genesis 9, saying, This is not a reason for you to say you cannot have children or should not have children in light of this broken world. But let us ask then, why is God so serious about this command? Be fruitful and multiply. Why does he insist on us being fruitfully, being fruitful and multiplying and filling the earth? Let's go back to Genesis 1 for a moment. And before we read the command to be fruitful and multiply, we would have read these massively important words, and I say that to put it mildly even, from Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27. And then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, 
He created him, male and female. He created them. So a people made in the image of God now are to turn and be fruitful and to multiply. So a few few weeks ago, Reeves, he talked about how man's primary purpose is God's glory. So to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. So these children then are, the picture here, these children then are to go and spread God's image, going out spreading God's name and God's fame and God's glory. I mean, that's amazing. <laughs> I mean, I just see that. And that's what our children are, we are to be even aiming our children at being and doing, is spreading his name and his glory. As Habakkuk 2.14, it says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So we as believers then are to unashamedly embrace this call and this command to be fruitful and multiply. multiply. So we are given children to further his, his name and his glory. Next we see, uh, we need to see here, children aren't just a command, though. They are a reward. So they're not just a command, they're a reward. So children, they are a blessing from the Lord. So Psalm 127. It says this in verse 4. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. And even verse 3, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. So may we not then be dissuaded from loving and being overjoyed at having children that God has or may give us. Let's not take on this, this mentality of our culture, of this ab- even abortion kind of mindset that says children are not valuable. Abortion is an evil beyond words, and we, above all people, should walk in ways that make clear as believers and followers of Jesus Christ that we love and we see our children as blessings. Now, there are some specific ways, though, that God uses our children to bless us, even if we at times may struggle to see that, if you know what I mean. (laughs) So in the midst of parenting, in the midst of taking care of your children, sometimes you can miss the reality of how God is blessing you with children. So one way God uses our children to bless us is to sanctify us. I don't have it up there, so you can just kind of put those as little notes on the the side. I wrestled with whether to include that in this outline or not, and in the end, I didn't, but maybe we'll do it next time if we do it again like this. So, So in that first moment, When you hold that little person in your arms, you cannot but feel the weight of responsibility that you now have as a parent. That weight, that responsibility immediately demands that you begin looking away from self. God, in his wisdom, moves us from singleness, where we are only responsible for ourselves, somewhat, to marriage, where we must turn to care for our spouses, at least we should. And then he turns us still further away from self with having children. So when you get to the point where your emotions are flying all over the place, understand now that God is seeking to change your heart as much as he is using you to impact your children's hearts. God is concerned about You, as you are sitting there struggling with your children as they fight or yell or whatever is going on. So when we're bothered, so recognize the word I just used there, when we're bothered by our children, our own need for sanctification is often right there at the forefront. God is doing something and seeking to do something in your heart and our hearts. And sometimes our children may not even be doing something wrong, but they're bothering us. 
I know if you're a parent, you, understand, you know what I mean. They're not sinning. They're not necessarily breaking rules, but they're bothering you because something is going on in your heart. They're coming to you to be parented and you longing for some time for yourself or a moment to think, become impatient or angry, and you begin fighting for your way and your autonomy. And like I began, remember the challenges we face in our families of sin? Well, that's a challenge right there. That's what we're seeing. Just like our children, when they act up, when they sin, they're demanding that you listen, that you give them that candy bar or whatever it is. They're fighting for their autonomy. And now, in that moment, you are fighting for your autonomy. It's the same idea. So, James, in James chapter 4, verse 1, it says this. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. So this naturally leads us then, in light of this, to see that God, he is working in your heart, and that's a good thing to sanctify us and blessing us with that truth with our children and having children. This naturally leads us to another way God uses our children to bless us. He uses our children to show us our need for him. He uses our, uh, uses our children uh, to show us our need for him. So we aren't meant to parent without God and dependence on him. So that moment when you're bothered by your children, it is not a moment for you just to say, ha, oh, you know, I'm just a terrible parent or whatever else. It is a moment for you to say, God, I need you. I need your grace. I need the gospel just as much as my children do. So like our children depend on us, we are to depend on God. So our, our inability in parenting is meant, and in families, is meant to drive us to our knees. And so we need God's grace, and we need the gospel as much as our children do. And so this leads us to see also that God uses our children to show us our sin and our need for grace. We sin as parents. You know, admit it. <laughs> Don't hide from it. Something that the Lord's been showing me recently, just, just think about Adam and Eve. What did they do when they sinned against God? They hid from him. Right. And that's what we do. When, when we're sinning, we, we hide from our sin. But let me just say, we really don't have anything to hide from. We're believers in Jesus Christ. We need to honestly admit that we sin and be honest with that before God and even before our children. And so as our children see our sin and imperfections, there and then we have an, out, have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to point them to our Savior, even in our sin. We need grace just as much as they do. We need the Savior as much as they do. We aren't saved because we were good boys and girls, but because of Christ and Christ alone. And so we can display that as parents, saying, son, daughter, I am a sinner. And it's just a fact. And mommy, daddy, we mess up. And just like I sin, you sin, and I pray that you would come to faith in this Savior. And we can tell our children that. When we sin, we can come to them. And I know they've done this many times. I've had to come to our children to say, listen, I am sorry. We, and ask, for, ask them for forgiveness for something I've said or done and sinning against them. So time and time again, I've done that. I came to, you know, I've come to, you know, Elizabeth and I said, listen, I am sorry. Just sitting down with her face to face, eyes looking at me. I'm sorry I, I'm, I sinned and I'm sorry for being impatient with you. Will you forgive me? And, you know, our children will say, yeah, I forgive you, Daddy. And then I'll say, listen, Daddy is a sinner, and I need Jesus too. Just as much as you sin, I sin, and I need Jesus. And I pray, and I hope that you would come to know Jesus also. 
And so every time, so whether it's your children, you know, they're messing up <laughs> and sinning, or whether it's us, you know, that gives us an opportunity to shine the light of Jesus to our children. And so this has allowed us to not only show our children how to respond when they sin against someone, or when they have a conflict with someone, but it gives us an opportunity to emphasize our only hope is Jesus Christ, and then to turn them to him and to urge them to him also. Another way God uses our children is he teaches us how to love. Yeah, I don't have these on here, but you can kind of see these. These are just rewards that perhaps you don't see uh, as well, but God uses our children to teach us how to love. God uses people to teach us to, to love people. God uses our children to teach us to love him and love others more. So again, we must think more of others. We must think more of their good, both physically and spiritually. And then one last way, though I think there are more, and we could spend a lot of time on how children are reward in multiple ways from multiple angles, God uses our children to show us how much he gave in sending his son into the world to save sinners. So short, it points to Jesus. He uses our children to point to Jesus in the way that in his love. So the gospel is made all the more tangible and visible through our deep love for our children. And if I went around the room, I'm sure you would all say, you know, if you have children, that you, you love them. And you love them dearly. But let me just say, too, our love does not compare to God's infinite love. And then think about that in the, in, with the truth that God sent his son into the world to save sinners, his only son. And so we can see something of what that picture is as well. Now, before we turn from here, let me give a brief word about barren families. So there are families who, for various reasons, you know, aren't able to have children. Now, after all I've said, you aren't meant to conclude that God is showing you his disfavor because you aren't able to have children. It's important here to say three things about this. So first, God's purposes are mysterious. So I cannot tell you all the reasons why God has for why you specifically are not able to have children. But I can say that God's purposes are good. And sometimes that's exactly what we need to hear in the midst of the reality, the, the difficulty of barrenness. Even if you can't see them now, even if you can't see that God's purposes are good, he knows, in his he knows what you're going through and his plans for you are still intact. It is not, you're not a failure, you're not, you know, you haven't messed up. Just know your, God's plans are still intact. And it's not dismissing your hurt to say this. So Romans 8.28, well-known passage. Um, it gives this encouragement. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. Including barrenness. That's one thing. So second... The fall's deep and sad effects are real. So the fall is not simply something we believe in the abstract. So sometimes if, you, if, you've, been, if you've grown up in church or uh, you know, you've been going to Sunday school and everything else, you know the Christian lingo, lingo and everything else, you may sometimes not apply the realities of what the Word of God says. And let me just say, but this is a time when we need to admit that the, the reality of the fall is evident in our struggles and in barrenness. It really happened. We weren't only affected spiritually by the fall, we were affected physically as well. Our bodies are broken, and that we must turn to say our hope is still in the God who made us. Third, whether you are able to have children or not, your meaning and this may be hard to receive, your meaning, worth, and identity aren't primary 
they're not primarily to come from your children or your lack of children. So for that matter, nothing is to take the place of Jesus in defining who we are and what we're living for. Not our spouses, not our jobs, or anything else. Jesus, he says these words here, which they're, <laughs> they're shocking, and no matter which way you put it, um, because he's calling for us to, to have undivided devotion to him. Matthew 10, verse 37 It says this, Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So our identity is found in Christ. He's saying that he is to be your treasure above anything else. And that does not displace your hurt, does not mean you can't be hurt, but just realize that your children, your spouse, your job, your marriage, none of those things are to take the place of Jesus. And if I could just speak honestly with you, if that's happening, what's happening in your heart is you're beginning to swerve towards an idol. And Jesus is saying, I alone can help you find true joy in all these things. So none of this means you won't hurt or it's wrong to hurt, but entrust yourself to him who deeply loves and cares for you. Along with this, let me encourage those who aren't able to have children to consider adoption. Adoption only allows you to fulfill your desires and heart for children, but it pictures the gospel and how we who are not, we're not God's children we're adopted into the family of God. So more could be said about this. I mean, we, should, we could have a whole class on adoption. But see, God's purposes are greater than you can imagine. So let's now turn to look at God's word concerning roles of parents and children in our families. So one way to confront the challenges our families are facing today is to be the mother or be the father God has called you to be. So let your children see the goodness and the rightness of God's plan for the family by embracing the God-given roles he's given for you as mothers and as fathers. So you want to you want to confront the challenges we face we I mentioned at the beginning, this is one way to do that. To model godly masculinity, to model godly femininity before your children. So here then, mothers, embrace your call to nurture and nourish. So in essence, we see here the truth of women being helpers. So after God had created man, after God had put man in the garden to work and to keep it, and after God had given his command to Adam not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, then it says... In Genesis 2.18, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So God, he provided him, man, Adam, a helper. And the idea of helper here isn't that women are secondary or lesser than or inferior to men. This does not mean that women are a doormat. That does not mean that you can abuse women. That does not mean that you can uh, abuse them physically or verbally. But in light of the fact that God has made men and women equal... In light of men and women's equality, God made the woman uniquely with this role as helper. Her role here would be to complement the man. And not just compliment the man, compliment the child, like, yes, and compliment the man, but help their children and help even society and help even the world. 
So we see this role expanded to the family as well. So Proverbs 31, I'm not going to turn there. Uh, so the Proverbs 31 woman is a woman who is not just kind of like this side note to the family. She is a bulwark for the family, like a foundational piece of the family. So in light of the whole realm of Proverbs, so uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of, of knowledge, Proverbs 1, 7, we see that this Proverbs 31 woman is a woman who is living out her femininity as a helper in the fear of God. We're seeing what this picture of a biblical woman should look like in the Proverbs 31 woman. Titus 2 also, it gives us insight into this picture of how mothers nurture and nourish. It says that the older women are to train the younger women to love their husbands and their children. And it goes on. In verse 5, it says of the, the same light to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to the husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. So we see there the need as well for older godly women also. And they're also the church. As women live out this role in their marriages as helper and in their homes in the church, and in life, the picture of biblical femininity isn't undermined, no matter how much you hear and you will hear about that from our culture. What you instead see is it's modeled and its glory is rightly seen. And think of what Titus said, that the word of God may not be reviled. As she's loving her husband and her children, as she's Walking in all these ways, self-controlled, prayer, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands. God's name is magnified. And so our children, whether male or female, see the glory of godly mothers living out what it means to fear their God. Next, fathers need to embrace their call to mold and to model. To mold and to model. So fathers specifically are called to lead their family spiritually. They are to intentionally and purposely bring up their children in the discipline and in the instruction of the Lord. So apart from what, you know, Reeves has already said about a husband's role to lead from the beginning chapters of Genesis as you've walked through, we see the specific command for fathers as well from Deuteronomy chapter 6. So you want to turn there, Deuteronomy 6. Six four. So hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and the, with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign in your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So yes, you know, you'd be right to say there fathers was not used once in that passage like, specifically. But the you used there is a masculine singular pronoun in the Hebrew. So what does that mean? <laughs> well, this emphasis on the masculine is meant to show us the focus here is upon men and upon fathers specifically. So God is giving this command specifically to fathers. You could include the mother there too, like parents, but specifically, he's giving this command to fathers, saying, this is your role, fathers, to lead your children in this way. And we're going to talk about that, how to do this very practically in a minute. So both parents, yes, are called to teach their children God's word, but specifically, the father is called to lead his family spiritually. So he is to model and to mold. He has to intertwine God's word into all of life. Just like we saw in Deuteronomy, right? As they walk by the way, as they lie down, as they rise up, 
So this means, fathers, we are to be involved in the lives of our children. Sit down and play with your children. Wrestle with your children. Talk with your children. Take them out for times just for that son or daughter. I mean, this week, I'm going to be taking, Lord willing, Elizabeth out. We're just going to go. She loves reading books. And that's another key point, fathers. Do what your children like to do. (laughs) Not just what you want to do. So we're going to go out to the library and just sit down and start reading books together. Because she loves reading. And then we're going to go out and eat and just talk together. And she's three years old. Not too early to begin. And she loves these times. She looks forward to it. She's, this whole past week she said, Daddy, are we going to go out and read library books and do all this stuff? And, she's, and I was like, yep, we're going to be doing it, just you and me. <laughs> and she's looking forward to that. And so we can be creative with our children and helping them to, uh, to show them Christ. So be interested in what they're interested in and then be there for them. Next, children listen and learn. If we leave our children to themselves, wow, <laughs> they would be in bad shape. So don't take to mind what the culture says, just kind of let them do what they do. You know, give them what they want. Remember, they're leaning toward a sinful kind of autonomy. So to do that is to give them, give in to their sinful hearts and desires. And that is only reiterating in them their foolishness in the end is what Proverbs says. So God has not intended our children to be left to themselves. We are to be there. So their fight, our children's fight and temptation will be like everyone else's. They will be full. They will pull and fight and push for their own autonomy. Their sinful hearts, they will bug against anyone who tries to keep them from getting what they want. Right? You can tell them, you know, no. Oh, okay. And then they'll ask a second again, you know, just a few seconds later, can I have that uh, cookie? <laughs> you know, no, not right now. We'll see about later. And then you keep going, and eventually, <laughs> ah, you know, they, they break down. They start crying. They are saying, Mommy, Daddy, I want my way. <laughs> and so we, in light of Proverbs, are to come. You see the foolish person, the wise person. You see this whole picture of parents in Proverbs saying, you are to lovingly lead your children and help them away and to turn away from this foolish heart of sin and self. And there we must admit that our children are sinners. I knew some people that would not say that. They, they would say that's going too far um, to say that. But they're born lost. If we let them go their own way, they will hurt themselves and others. Children then are called upon in Scripture to listen and to learn from the parents. And that's why they need us so much. And this is the fifth commandment, which Paul also repeats in Ephesians 6 when he wrote, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first command with a promise that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land, which leads us to the next point as well, families govern and guide. So, Respect for authorities is taught, and it begins with the family. It begins in the home. So I won't spend much time on this point, but I'll simply say, if our children are not learning to submit to parental authority at home, then they won't be inclined to submit to other authorities outside the home. And that's why in Ephesians, in part, it says that it may go well with them, with you, and that you may live long in the land. And that commandment there fifth commandment as well. A society where grown adults have learned not to submit to authorities is a fearful thought. (laughs) Again, when God's design is avoided, confused, refused, or abandoned, the results will be devastating. So before we leave this section, though, on the roles, let's look at one last aspect here. And really, this is very personal to parents and challenges you will face or are facing or are dealing with, and maybe you don't even know you're dealing with it. But here are some parental dangers for our children. And so these are pitfalls. You know, I've modified these a little bit, but many of these owe the origin to Paul uh, David Tripp's book on parenting. Excellent book. It will confront and challenge your heart. It will, it's a call to examine your heart on almost every single chapter, But the first danger we see our children um, 
as, or one, one area we see here is uh, we see them as our trophies. This is one danger um, in our own hearts that we can have. So this is when we make our parenting more about helping our children be successful so that we can say we're good parents. It's about our reputation. It's not wrong to want our children to do well. I'm not saying that, but to find meaning as parents in their doing well is dangerous for us and for our children. When they don't live up to our expectations, not only will we move away from parenting the way that God has called us to, our children, they will be overwhelmed by the unreasonable burdens we are placing on them. So helpfully, Paul David Tripp, he asks these kind of hard examination questions in his book. He says, could it be that you want your children to succeed too much because you need them to succeed? Could it be that your children are beginning to break under the heavy load of your expectations? Could it be that the resistance you are getting from your children is there not because they are rebellious and lazy, but because you are asking too much of them? Could it be that you are so focused on your children's accomplishments that you have not paid enough attention to the condition of their hearts? And I know all those questions, and they dig deep, and they require us to examine our hearts and why we do what we do as parents. Another danger is we see them as our purpose. We see them as our purpose. So we were created to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And our children were as well. So if we make our children our purpose in life, when they've moved on and they made a family of their own, we will be tempted to cling to them in ways that are unhealthy and can damage not only your relationship with them, but can damage your relationship with your spouse as well. There can be huge issues there. Another danger is we emphasize what they do more than who they are. We emphasize what they do more than who they are. Parenting isn't simply about behavior modification. It may be tempting to, I mean, it's not that their behavior doesn't matter, but if we're solely focusing on their behavior, that's not what we should be aiming at primarily. You may get your children to behave, but the question is, will they see their need for the gospel? Or will we be teaching them kind of a moralism? Be good in church. Be good at home. Be good around others. And yet they haven't realized why they struggle in their own hearts with all these things. So we must come to the table recognizing our children need Christ. More than behavior, we must be concerned with their hearts. They need new hearts. So all of these dangers point us to our great need then to see. Number six, we must find our identity in Christ and not our children. I think I've pointed to this in multiple ways and, and uh, different points throughout this time. But it's so important that we see this and we'll wrestle with this all the days we parent. <laughs> and your life as a Christian. So ultimately, our identity is to be defined by Christ. And this will not only help us, but it will help our children also. So Again, Tripp writes this. He says, Isn't it good to know that because Jesus gives us life overflowing, we are freed from looking for life from our children or anywhere else? Isn't it good to know that because we are the children of God, we have reason to continue even on our worst, most disastrous parenting day? Isn't it good to know that as Jesus fully satisfies our hearts, we don't have to ask our children to provide that satisfaction for us? So in light of the time, I will try to move through these last points rather quickly. <laughs> so very practically then, let us answer how are we to aim our homes to be headquarters for gospel ministry. The first thing we can see here is that your family is ground zero for the Christian mission of proclaiming the gospel and making disciples. So essentially, this means we are to be the primary disciplers of our children. So the church aims to impact our children 
for the sake of the gospel, yes. But the church is not meant to take the place of parents. So parents and future parents, embrace this calling. Even more, make your home a headquarters for gospel ministry. Through your family, may it be that others see the gospel. Your neighbors, your co-workers, your friends, your family, and our church. This is not a call for Christian perfection. It's a call to pursue homes where even your sin, as we talked about before, serves as an opportunity to proclaim the gospel. Next, share God's word and the gospel. Again, I will say, your children are born into this world lost. They do what they do because they need the Savior. Your goal is to show them that. Not not that you can save them, not that you can persuade them, not that you, in the end, are the one who will determine whether they come to Christ That would be another danger I did not mention is to think that you can actually make your children turn to Jesus Christ. They may not, but what you are called to do is to be faithful. You are called to be faithful in modeling, molding, nourishing, nurturing, sharing the gospel with your children at home. And you'll have a lot of opportunities for that. (laughs) When they lie, when they hit their brother or sister, when they disobey. You know, each one of those times affords you an opportunity to lovingly and graciously, and when you don't lovingly as well and graciously, you can point them to their need for new hearts and their need for Jesus. Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer, he said this. He said, The best thing in married life for the sake of which everything ought to be suffered and done is the fact that God gives children and commands us to bring them up to serve him. To do this is the noblest and most precious work on earth because nothing may be done which pleases God more than saving souls. Next, weave God's word and the gospel into your home informally. Informally. So we saw in Deuteronomy chapter 6 that we are to intertwine God's word throughout our daily lives and activities. So also, as we seek to make our homes headquarters for gospel ministry as well. So how do we do this? Well, we can do so very practically, conversationally. This means as we discuss our days, as we discuss happenings in the world, or really anything can be turned to a conversation in light of what God's Word says. What you listen to or watch also serves for great conversations about the things of God and His Word. There have been times that I've, and Megan can attest to this, that we've done this on multiple occasions, that, you know, we've stopped watching a movie or listening to a song or watching a show to take time to just discuss what we just heard and to think about it or what we just watched. So, you know, the goal in this is to help our children to think about the Word of God in light of the reality of the Christian worldview in all of life. So in light of what God has done in his word, intertwining the truths of God's word into all of life. Next, weave God's word and the gospel into your home formally. So some of you may be familiar with this, and some of you may not. Um, But here I'm specifically encouraging you to lead your family in worship. And that may be crazy to say, but hear me out. So, This is what is traditionally called family worship. So what is family worship? It's a way to intentionally and purposefully lead your family in God's word and in worship. At first, it may sound intimidating, but in its most basic form, it's simply about reading the Bible, talking about it, and praying. So Megan and I, we began doing this even before we had children. So our children simply, when we, when we had children, they simply just kind of joined in what we were already doing. More than its basic form, though, there are other things you can do with family worship. You can add other things like uh, singing. <laughs> it may be crazy for you to think about. Or uh, memori- and memorizing scripture. 
but we do that. That's usually what we try to include in our times in family worship. So in the short time we have here, my best encouragement to you would be to start with the Bible in prayer and move on from there. I mean, that's very basic, very easy. It doesn't have to be long. Sometimes we've, as a family, we've went five minutes. Other times we've went 30 minutes. So it just depends on what's going on. And you can do it at the dinner table. Uh, You can do it in the family room or you can do it somewhere else. So what we do is we read in manageable portions per the age of our children and we mix it up as well. And so what, what we'll often do in our family worship is we'll often read from the Old Testament on Monday. We'll look and... Hey, by the way, you do not have to follow our pattern in how we do this. This is just what we do, and it's just an example to hopefully help you as well in thinking through this. But we read through the Old Testament on Monday. Uh, We'll talk about doctrine on Tuesday. So, like, walk through a catechism together. If you know what that is, basically it teaches about doctrine and theology. And so we walk through, uh, you can get an app called New City Catechism. It has children songs on there, too. You You can sing together. Uh, and has uh, uh, Bible passages there as well to support what they're saying. So we do that on Tuesday, and then on Wednesday we'll, again, we'll do Old Testament. Thursday we'll read from the New Testament, and on Friday through Saturday we read through like a storybook Bible. And of course, if your children are older or whatever, you can adjust it however way you see as well. Lastly, apply God's Word and the Gospel to real life. So let God's word filter into all you do. Let your times out and about having fun be an opportunity to to marvel at God's goodness. Let work and even taking your children along with you to do something be an opportunity to mold a godly work ethic and to teach on what godly work should look like for our children. And take the opportunity to work through conflict. Even when you come to your child and you say, hey, can you forgive me for this? And you teach them, to say, I forgive you, you're helping them to work through how to deal with conflict with other people. Yes, their own sin. Yes, with you, but also with their brother, with their sister, with mother, with people in the workplace, and so on. And when you discipline your children as well. So set aside times to specifically find ways to reach out to others as a family for the sake of the gospel. These are all ways to to apply God's word our lives and the gospel to real life. So in all this, in closing, may it be that we would unashamedly and wholeheartedly pursue Christ and following Christ in all that we do. And I'll end with these words from Psalm 78, verse 1 through 4. So encouraging and so good. They say, Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generations the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. And so may we do that. May that be our heart as we consider, you know, God's family being, um, focusing on God's family and thinking through our families and our marriages and our children and our roles and everything else. May we do that for his glory. Let me close this in prayer. I don't, I didn't ask for any questions. You, before I close in prayer, are there any questions? Like very briefly, we have like a few seconds here. <laughs> oh, five minutes. Okay. I know we've walked through a lot, so... Yes.
Mm -hmm. That's good. It's a good question, a good point. So the question was, you know, in light of the cultural understanding of uh, fathers and mothers, how do we how do we walk through that? And so, in the example we gave fathers, you know, being bumbling fools and kind of absent. Well, I think um, one is like when we as a family have walked through these things, if it's a show or a movie or the news or an article, we'll even sit down at our, our table and bring up some of these things and say, so this is what, what, we've, what I heard about today. What do you guys think about that? And children involved too in the discussion, everybody involved in the discussion say, what do, you, what do you think about this? Do you think it's right? Do you think it's, it's what God's word says about how fathers are to be? And first off, that helps them to think about it themselves and it helps you to see where they are and it also helps you to walk through God's word with them and say, you know, the way that they're picturing fathers and mothers, it's not the way that God actually says they should be. Guys are not to be these, you know, uh, kind of just to say idiots. <laughs> you know, that's what they're that's what they're depicted as in, in shows. I mean, they're they're these guys who are indifferent. They're found, you know, sitting in the the chair, not not really involved in their family that much. Uh, if at all, in different ways, um, they may uh, be playing video games or whatever else. And Mama comes in and says, "Come on, everybody!" And she's the one leading the family. But we can say then, "Well, here is what God's word says," you know. And we can see. We can even explain to our children why is all this happening this way in our world. Well, we can say even as Dr. York's been preaching on spiritual warfare, Satan is very actively seeking to undermine the family undermined, I would even say this is a proof of the biblical truth, undermine gender roles. He's reversing everything. And I'm sure, as Megan and I have said, I'm sure he is probably laughing at some of the things that people are believing right now. Can you believe that I actually got them to believe this? You know, but I did, you know, and that's just the thing is that I think that it is very much what's going on. Satan is trying to deceive blind people, and totally negate anything that the Word of God says. And so then we can come and say, and work through questions as well that they have, and go to passages, even the ones we walk through today, um, even the ones that Reeves has talked through as well. So does that help answer your question? Okay. Any other questions or thoughts? Well, let me close this in prayer, and let me just say, too, it's been a joy being able to be here and teach you guys, and um, let me pray. Father, thank you for this morning and our time to be able to walk through your word. And I pray as we consider all these things, I know it was a lot, it's a lot to think through, and even a lot to examine our own hearts in, I pray that you would help us do that. Help us to come to your word with submissive hearts, even as we, we face the challenges of our culture, that we would go to your word. We would walk through these things with our families and our children, and we would point them to the truth. And may you give us grace, give us love, um, and help sanctify us, even as you have said you do and you will do. And so we ask also that you would be with our children and lead them to faith in Jesus Christ as well and help us in sharing the gospel with them. And now, Father, we pray for Dr. York as he preaches the word and give us grace as we go into the service. May you open our hearts and give us grace to submit to all that you uh, show us there. In Jesus' name, amen.